How many of you had a Labor Day cookout and you asked someone, how are they doing? And they said, I'm good. All right, here's the question. Is good the enemy of great? We're going to talk about it today. Welcome to the ultimate crowdsource personal finance show. This is Chusify. All right, everybody. Today we're discussing from good to great. Is good the enemy of great? And how do we make the transition? And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I am doing quite well. Yeah, we... Uh had some interesting times here in the old uh, Barrett household. But first, on the good, my daughters went to school today. So that was fantastic. That's great. Yeah. First, <laughs> first day of school, they were absolutely thrilled to get started. And yeah, we did all our normal, uh, you know, celebrations of the little four, first day of fourth grade, first day of eighth grade signs and all that stuff. So yeah, it was, it was really, really cute. They're growing up. They're yeah. growing up so fast. Oh, man. It's crazy. Crazy, crazy. You're going to have like a ring dance soon and high school prom and just, it's just, it's just um, racing towards you. Yeah. It's astonishing to think like when we started, when we started this podcast, I mean, it's coming up on five years ago, I think. Right. And I mean, that's wild. It was, yeah, five years. So yeah, my older daughter was in third grade then, and now she's finishing up middle school. Look at you. Who would have thought you're successfully pulling off this whole parenting thing? I mean, it's just, it's really incredible how you're nailing the process of adulting now. I think you're a real adult. <laughs> a real adult. You know, <laughs> that's actually hilarious because I, I think I, I actually had this epiphany. The first thing that I've done where I was like, oh, wow, this is like a real adult thing to do is I actually just recently got a safe deposit box. <laughs> at my bank. I didn't even tell you about this, but I, I literally said to the banker, I'm like, this is going to be the most pathetic thing you've heard all day. But I'm like, this feels like a really adult thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've for a long time had stuff in like a fireproof safe here at the house. And, you know, I'm pretty fanatical about, uh, you know, keeping track of things, keeping records, keeping backups. And it just, uh, it just seemed time to get a safe deposit box. So time to do it, cool. to write a passage. That was kind of cool. But uh, I guess on the downside of what's been going on here, we have had this insane, like, I don't know what you'd call it, swarm or whatever, but of these army worms in Richmond, Virginia here. And uh, Jonathan, I see you nodding your head along as you've heard about this. Like, we got back from our vacation, right? So we, we got back from our Red Axe month and it had been like 95 degrees, 95 to 100 degrees the whole prior week. So we got home. The lawn didn't look great, right? You thought maybe you'd left the irrigation off, right? Oh, we forgot to water. Yes. And I, and I did forget to water because oh. <laughs> I knew the first couple of weeks they were, we were getting downpours. I'm like, so it was a hard balance, right? So anyway, uh, come home. There were some brown spots. I'm like, oh, that's not great, but at least understandable. And then I woke up the next morning and the brown spot had quadrupled. It was like literally my whole, well, not literally my whole lawn, but let's say 50 to 60% of my lawn brown. I'm like, what on earth is going on? And then a neighbor of mine actually came over. He's like, uh, Hey man, do you mind if I test something out? I saw something on a Facebook group about these crazy army worms that are like invading Richmond lawns. And he did this little test with, I don't know, soapy water or whatnot. And you know, right there were these, you know, caterpillar type army worms. And I was like, Oh man, that explains. And of course they spread to my backyard. So I'm oh. now down 60% of the entire lawn, which is just absolutely wonderful. This is like, uh, you know, one of the joys, the many, many joys of homeownership, which is basically a money pit at all times. After, after like four years, you know, of like treating your lawn and doing all the right things and following the lawn calendar, or maybe taking the easy path, but paying the bills for something like a, you know, a green company that comes out and does it all for you. You, know, you finally get to quote unquote steady state. And then the, the equivalent of the blight comes through <laughs> and turns it into the equivalent of grass oatmeal yep. in one day. It should be impossible. It should be impossible. And I tell you, Brad, you know how like there's been these sneaky suspicions that I think have been confirmed that like your phones are listening. That's not even a suspicion. Everybody knows that your phones are listening to you and it uses it for ad marketing. Like you talk about dog toys right now. If I talk about dog toys right now, <laughs> you know, dog toy, I want a dog toy, cheap dog toy, whatever. If I go onto the internet, Within three hours, doesn't matter if it's that device or something else, the internet is going to serve up to me, you know, Kong toys in every size and flavor okay. for my dog. It will absolutely happen. Test it. Promise you it'll happen. We all know that. Well, when you told me about the blight hitting your yard, 
it was like the equivalent effect. I kind of knew I was screwed as soon as you said it out loud. I go out the next day and sure enough, the, they've hit my yard. They've, 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 they've done this little patch just to the side of my house that's turned a mushy brown color. I go ahead and do the exact same thing you're talking about. Just fill up a jug with, you know, Dawn dishwater sugar detergent and water, pour it over there. And sure enough, those little one and a half inch, you know, caterpillar looking things are right there. It reminded me of like, I don't know if anybody watches a little anecdote uh, going back nostalgia here, 1990s, like Winnie the Pooh, uh, the animated adventure series. They had this little Disney series that came out in the 90s. And in this series, the rabbit is always attacked by effectively this caterpillar, this malicious caterpillar that is able to eat acres of produce in a series of minutes. I always thought it was just something horrible. It always terrified me, even in that cartoon <laughs> series. They look so evil. Now I've met it in real life, and it has lived up to the hype. These army worms are here, and they're wreaking havoc. And I actually feel apologetic to everybody that's listening to this episode because by increasing your zone of awareness about them, it's now more likely that they're going to come into your yard. And I apologize, <laughs> but you know this is our cathartic oh, way funny. of venting the frustration of losing multiple years of lawn progress, right? <laughs> but yeah, it does remind me of, uh, well, two things. First... I kind of stirred up a little hornet's nest on my new Twitter account talking about essentially like your home being a terrible investment. And that's, you know, very distinct from real estate investing, which is hmm. very, very distinct of you are going, as we've talked with Chad Carson and Paula Pant, going in with eyes wide open, creating a business around, around rental real estate. And, you know, then thinking about, all of these tiny little expenses that just people don't consider in their mental returns on their own single family house. And that's not to say that it's a bad decision by any means, because it's primarily a lifestyle decision and a psychological decision. But in general terms, your actual return when you factor all of these things, you know, the now the seed and aeration that I need to get done on this, or oh, we had a little leak in our roof because the solar panels had a little issue and that was $150 to fix. And, you know, all of these things that just it's like I think of that old Tom Hanks movie, The Money Pit, you know, and it's like, well, <laughs> the bathtub hasn't quite yet fallen through the uh through the ceiling. It, it sometimes seems like that. So anyway, you know, that's, that's kind of one thing. But on the bright side, I had a DIY success here Ooh. in the last couple of days. So we have a, uh, what's it, a Kohler toilet in our master bathroom, uh, master bathroom, excuse me. And I noticed that it was running just in an odd way. And I looked in there and they have a, a like a flapper system, unlike any I've seen. Like I'm, I, That's like one thing I'm actually good at in the house is like kind of troubleshooting. Like if there's an issue you know, in the, the toilet tank, you know, is some kind of like, you know, the chains off or the flapper, et cetera. And I was like, what on earth is this? I've never seen anything like this. And I noticed this plastic piece that was loose. So just did a quick YouTube search, saw a two minute video on how to replace this, ordered the part from Amazon for, I think it was $4 and 27 cents. It showed up the very next day and I fixed it in sub 10 minutes. So wow. that was just like, it was awesome. It was like the quintessential like DIY success because invariably I would have had to call a plumber and it would have been 90 or $120 just for the, the house call. And, you know, who knows what I, what I would have gotten charged for the part that cost me four bucks. And it, it just felt good. That was like, yeah, one of those, you know, as you always say, Jonathan, right? It's like YouTube, you can learn anything on YouTube. You can fix anything by watching videos on YouTube, on YouTube. So yeah, that, that was a, that was a good one. We have to come back to that. I think people don't appreciate the value of being able to get an answer to a question, you know, now um, a real, a good answer. Now, you know, it's a little bit more of a tangent. I think now we have so much information that it's really more a matter of filtering, but um, there, there is something there. Um, and congratulations. I know for you, um, DIY is always that uh, white whale. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. so I lost my lawn, but the toilet is fixed. <laughs> well, it's working great. Well, it's working great. <laughs> still, still net negative, but, uh, but I feel pretty good about it. All right, let's go. Let's talk about the, the, the title of the episode. Here. Let's talk about this idea uh, is good. The enemy of great um, inspiration for this. Uh, Jim Collins, different Jim Collins, well-known Jim Collins, uh, author of another book called Built to Last. And then this book came out in 2000 ish called Good to Great. Uh, I was given this book as a gift by my brother. 
And while it is primarily focused on leadership and business principles, what I find very fascinating about a lot of these business types books is the ability to extrapolate those eternal truths into personal lessons, things that can be used in your own personal life. And so I thought, you know, uh, Brad, we could we could just kind of go back and forth because I think this is the really big thing, and it's framed a couple different ways. Uh, but I think there's something here for us to explore. Is good the enemy of great? The idea being because change feels hard, we just settle. And we do that in part because we can't really even visualize what what great might look like. And, and there's a, you know, you see this in different aspects of your life. We don't have great schools because we have good schools. We don't have great government because we have good government. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't really try to attain great lives because it's so much easier to settle just for a good one. And the example that I just used earlier is you ask someone how they're doing. They're like, you know, I'm doing good. And in my mind, knowing how I just think, it's because if I say I'm doing bad, I'm going to have to explain that. And it's not so bad that it's worth that additional conversation. And so it's just good. Good's just kind of like a default answer. If you were actually doing great, you would probably tell them you are doing great. Man, let me tell you, I have had an amazing, but people don't do that. They just say, yeah, I'm doing good. Doing good. How's, how's the weather? How's it? I'm good. <laughs> and like, if that's the case, if, if good is keeping us from great or good is something that we settle for, the following question is, is good in reality, is it an incurable disease or is there something we can do about this? Yeah, that is, uh, that is very, very interesting. So I haven't read the book, so I'm interested in kind of your takeaways and I'd love to, uh, you know, kind of riff off that. But, but yeah, it's, it's interesting about, well, first that, you know, everyday conversation, right? Like it, it is kind of sad that it's just this perfunctory, like nonsense, right? Like people aren't even listening. It's just like, a, Hey, how are you? Great. Good. Blah, blah, blah. You know, like people are already moving on or it's like reflexive, right? Like you just answer, Oh, I'm doing good. Or how'd you sleep last night? Oh, I slept well. You know? And, and like, you just, you just answer like we're on autopilot. Right. And, and that to me is an interesting question of like, how do we get off of autopilot? Mm. Yeah. Right? Like that might be a, a deeper survey of, of our own psychological landscape of how do we get off of autopilot? How do we stop settling for good, even a very good? And what would it take to attain great? Right? Like that to me is interesting. It, it reminds me of, uh, of Domino Cortuccio, who's obviously been on the podcast so many times. And, and he talks about this, about like living out over your edge, right? And, and like being a little bit nervous about something, you know, he calls it uh, <laughs> throwing up a little bit inside your mouth. Like when you're, when you're faced with something like, you know, something that's scary, like how many, how many times do we actually face something that gets us nervous or we're excited about in a, in a, in a good nervous way? Like, if, if we're honest with ourselves, you could go years without facing anything like that. Mm. And that sure as, sure as heck is not great. Right, Jonathan? As you were saying that, I was thinking like every bit of growth that you ever experience comes from some form of friction or pain or, you know, leaning out over the edge, sewing up in your mouth, that whatever, you know, whatever verbiage you want to use. But when things are just easy, they're, they're, there's no growth. There, there's none. And so if you look back at the last, you know, year or two years or whatever, and you say, it's just, yeah, I've been coasting. I've been easy. It's, it probably hasn't been a, acted as a forcing function for growth. Brad, I'm just curious, like when you think back, what was the last point in time where you felt that throw up in your mouth sensation? And if you were to analyze that with the benefit of hindsight now, did, was there any growth associated with that? Yeah. I mean, I think, I don't know the, the very last time I suspect there's more, more recent times than this, but, but certainly it has a lot to do with this podcast, right? Like putting myself out there. I've talked so many times how public speaking, well, you know, everybody or most people credit, Oh, I hate public speaking. I'm definitely afraid. Like I was truly, truly afraid of public speaking, like, you know, on a, like, we're talking like 99th percentile level, like debilitating. And 
you know, a lot of the things, Jonathan, that you and I have done with public appearances and speeches and things, I think about the, uh, the playing with fire premiere here in Richmond, where we had 500 plus people. I forget what the exact count. I think it was 700 people. It was something crazy. I mean, that was one of those moments when we were standing backstage, even though we had done presentations, like I was thinking back on like the old Brad and like how I probably would have ran for the hills, honestly, but, but I leaned into that and it came out great. I mean, that was fantastic. I, and I've realized belatedly that that type of public speaking is really energizing for me. Like I, I genuinely love it. And I never would have known that because as humans, we want to avoid pain. We avoid this type of, of issues and conflict and all like difficult situations. Like that's just like our natural tendency. And this was an instance where, again, over the course of a time period, this is not like one, dis while I'm giving an, a specific example, it's not one discrete thing. It's over the course of those first couple of years of Choose a Vi, like I grew more than I could have imagined because this was something that was really difficult for me. Yeah. As I think what people struggle with in before they've kind of gone through this process is that we, when we, we have that moment of awakening, we often find ourselves so busy, so busy. We don't like to, to, to go through this, this process of self-awareness, to go through this process of exploration. The luxury of time is really, really in, important. We can call it time. We can call it bandwidth. We can call it space. I think it's something that being on the path to financial independence starts to provide us in increments, you know, to use the example of a pump or a flywheel, it takes a lot of momentum to get it going. And then you get over this, 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 you get, you get past, it's a continuum, but there is a point at which it switches and it starts working on your behalf and it takes less and less work, which that less and less work gives you more, you know, ability to continue to look around you and figure out, well, what else, how do I get more of, of whatever this is? And in the book, it's a, it's a, it's a business principle book and they're interviewing a lot of, uh, of business leaders. And in a lot of cases, they're making these pivots inside the business to focus on one aspect or another. And one of the questions they always, uh, would ask these business CEOs was like, well, how did you get the team on board? How did you get everybody motivated and aligned and all these other things? And the observation was, and they were really surprised by this, which is why I pulled it up is that almost without fail, all of the leaders didn't understand why they were asking the question. They were like, well, what do you mean? And here was the epiphany when they extrapolated out the data under the right conditions, under the right conditions, the problems of commitment, alignment, and opposition to change largely melt away. They go away. So if you can actually take the time to figure out what is your why, what is your purpose? What is, what, what would great actually look like for you? A lot of the obstacles that right now you might perceive that you have will, will melt away. Having said that, there's a second principle that really stood out to me and they coined this, the Stockdale par paradox and it's coined, they coined it inside the book, but it's coined after Admiral Jim Stockdale became a prisoner of war in Vietnam and decided to take the burden of responsibility on himself to, uh, kind of watch over the other prisoners that were there with them and come up with ways to make their existence easier. Although they were an incredibly trying, you know, uh, point and, and, and they're in human history, objectively, he was a prisoner of war for eight years. And for, and, and during that period of time, he, there was at one point where he actually disfigured himself to prevent, uh, at this time, the Vietnamese soldiers who, who wanted to present him as an image of how they were treating all the prisoners. Well, and he didn't want to be able to be taken advantage of like that. So he proactively, uh, disfigured himself. In addition, he would come up with ways to help people deal with torture. They, he, he created a, an elaborate communication system for the prisoners to be able to one, uh, be able to communicate with each other. But then two, you know, no one can resist torture for extended periods of time. So he gave them a system. Well, only give this amount of information after this period of time. So he just came up with all these coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And in an interview on the other side where they're talking to him and they're asking, well, how did you do all this? There was a principle that he laid out. He said, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, wherever they may be. Okay. 
You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties, and at the same time, have the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality as they might be. Now, here, here, here's the bit for me. The goal is a great life. The goal as an interim to get to that, as a tool to get to that, is financial independence. I am 100% convinced that this outcome will be a reality for me. I'm putting myself on my path. But at the same point, I don't need to hit it by Christmas. I don't need to hit it by Easter. I don't need to get 300% returns, you know, on one bet in the stock market. I'm creating a system and I'm 100% confident in the outcome. I'm also confident that obstacles are going to come and they are going to nuke, you know, my plan to whatever degree that they're able, but I'm still going to apply the system. And when he was asked, Brad, I'll give this as the final point before I give it back to you. He was asked, well, who wasn't able to survive the same period of time that you survived? He said, the optimist, the ones who said, we're going to get out of this by Christmas. We're going to get out of this by Easter. Those individuals died of a broken heart because it didn't happen at the exact time, at the exact structure, you know? And so being able to be brutally honest with your obstacles, but yet confident of the outcome allows you to outlast. It's a game of attrition. You're going to outlast. And this really stood with me as it's the, it's a different type of optimism. It's not a naive optimism. It's a brutally honest, but still optimistic outlook for the future. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. As you're saying that, it, it reminds me of like the, like the definition of cognitive dissonance, like holding two competing ideas in, in your mind at the same time, but like in the best possible way, right? Like this is, yeah, I agree that the irrational optimist is, is just like a head in the sand. Everything's going to turn out fine. I don't need to pay attention. I don't need to change anything. I don't need to learn anything new. And that's not the type of mindset that I think is going to help you be successful. I think you have to constantly be updating your knowledge base. You have to constantly be updating your reasoning based on new information right? Like you have to look at the probabilities of success based on what's it Bayesian thinking, right? It's like every time you get like a, a new piece of information, you have to go back and adjust how you look at the odds of success. And I think, I think that's, that's very, very reasonable, right? And I think all of us can say, all right, I can't just stick my head in the sand. I need to constantly be learning, but you have to also realize that like, the optimistic part and that there's nothing pessimistic about that at all. It's just, okay, things change, right? Like things change constantly and I need to learn. And then you have the optimism of like you, Jonathan, you haven't reached financial independence today, but you are, if, if I could put words in your mouth, 100% certain that you will reach financial independence, not 99%, 100%. But what's the timeline and what do I have to do to get there? Like you said, you don't need to hit a home run. You don't need to live in deprivation for the next five years just to reach this Shangri-La of, of Phi. Like, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't lead to a successful life because that's the balance point here. And I think this is really critical that everybody understands this. The goal is not just getting to Phi. Sure, it's great and it feels nice, but that is almost beside the point. We are building the fundamental bedrock of a good life, however you define that. And it's not my place to define that, Jonathan. It's not your place to define that for any of the listeners. Everyone needs to take a step back and have a critical look at their life, where it is today, the obstacles they need to overcome, and where they want their life to go, while also knowing that's going to constantly update, right? But look at, hey, what would, what would a great life look for me five years from now? And what are the steps that I need to take to get there? And sure, being on the path to Phi is going to help at every step of the way. Because as you said, Jonathan, it provides that space, right? It allows you to not be caught up in the constant rat race, the constant keeping up with the Joneses. It gives you that space to look at your life and say, what would this look like if it were great? Yeah. And you're, you're building this fortress, you know, as you go, uh, I remember when I started on my own path to financial independence, it started with six figures of student loan debt. And, 
when I would make the decision to make extra payments with this goal of paying off the student loans in about four to five years, um, each individual, you know, every two weeks where I'd make that additional extra payment, it really didn't feel like it was, it was doing much, to be honest with you, you know, to go from 160, you know, 168 in debt, and then you work for, you know, a couple of weeks, you get that paycheck and you, you're able to send an extra thousand dollars in or whatever. Um, now it's down to 167 and you're like, oh man, I guess in our two weeks and we'll try and make another stab at this. Uh, but you, you know, the flywheel was going very, very slow at that particular point in time. And it would be frustrating sometimes because you make headway, you pay off, you know, you pay off, you know, like five or six or seven thousand dollars over a period of time. And then suddenly you get an unexpected expense, you know, a car breaks down, a whole, army worms eat your front lawn, and <laughs> you know, wh whatever, whatever it is, it sets it sets you back. And that is an obstacle, and you got to face that, and you got to you know be brutally honest that that's going to set you back. But you're still one hundred percent convinced of the outcome. I'm going to get us here. I'm going to do what it takes to get us there. And I can tell you now, like with 100% certainty, financial independence is an inevitability for me. Even if, even if we were to experience a, something crazy, like some sort of 50% market, we just, we just experienced, well, you know, a taste of that, right? Some sort of 30% market crash. It, if we were to do something again, I am still, if something crazy would happen, I am 100% convinced of the path that I'm on getting me to financial independence because built on a system, not everything needs to go perfect. Everything's not going to go perfect. Some things are going to outperform, been blessed by amazing returns over the last couple of years in aggregate, really the last 10 years. If you were to have a 50% market drop, really the superpower in this scenario is the savings rate, right? It is the fact that we control our expenses and we've grown our income over time and we look at both sides of the equation that savings rate ends up being your superpower in this case. But then even more than that, the pivot from just a simple savings rate and, and to now thinking about, and I'll just say this to someone, I just, general, I feel filthy rich. Let me explain this to you. Anyone that gets to the point where they don't need to trade their time for dollars, right? They don't need to trade their life energy for dollars is filthy rich. Absolutely. Just, just carte blank. When you get to that point, forget your net worth you are filthy rich. You have reclaimed, you know, your most precious non-renewable resource. However you want to go about achieving that process, whether it's through absolutely crushing your expenses, like a, a Jacob from early uh, retirement extreme, uh, whether it is a go out and just, you know, shoot the moon with your income, whether it is creating passive income that frees up from your time, however you want to, however you want to tackle this. When you no longer need to trade your life energy for dollars, your time for dollars, you're filthy rich. And I feel like I figured that bit out and even, even, and it's a continuum, right? So like, even before I completely separated my time for my dollars, I had already stretched that, that stretched that connection pretty, pretty dramatically. And I use that space, Brad, to like, to go back to this initial idea, what does great actually look like? What do I want to start working towards? And you start ingesting additional ideas that make it easier. And this, this was frankly, you know, the, the time and ability that I've had to contemplate that and then explore that was not even something that I could consider when I first got started with just paying off my student loans. Like I didn't have that luxury. It was, it was, I just need to pay off the debt. I need to pay off this debt. Uh, but going back and I think this is the big, the, the, the point I wanted to send back to you when they asked all these CEOs who are making this big, this big pivot in many cases, and they, they'd made this transition from being a good company and then something happened and now they are a great company. And they're like, what was that point in time? What was that, what was that thing that you did that you figured out? And, and, it, and they really struggled with that. And, and the big realization was there is no miracle moment. There is no, there is no like single decision or that you made, you know, single thing. And, and on this side, you were good. And on this side, you're great. It's a continuum. And Brad, I feel like I feel very blessed and privileged because I feel like I'm on the path to a great life and I'm very blessed for what we've been able to build over the last years. But if I look at what is the moment, what is the actual moment? I don't know if I could nail it down. Instead, it was more just, I got on the path. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. And I, I'm thinking about it both in terms of for us, right? You know, we're talking about our own lives, both in terms of personal life and choose a five. Right. And yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, when they see P 
people living a great life or having built something great, they, they think there's that, there's that one kind of lightning in a bottle moment, right? That like, it's just, you hit the jackpot in some way. Like, you know, maybe with a, a website or a podcast, it's like, you got, I don't even know what it is anymore, you know, on the, the front page of the New York times or, you know, on NBC nightly news or something like, you know, something massive, like an, you know, old school media, but you know, I've seen people get that kind of stuff and it doesn't usually tip to, to uh, what's it tip the needle or whatever the saying is like all that much. And, you know, frankly with us, like that never happened, right? Like this was just, this was the best type of growth. It was just person to person organic growth. Right. And, and I look at that in the best possible way. Like I'm so proud of that, Jonathan, about choose a vibe, because, you know, when people ask me like, Oh, how did it grow so much? Like, I don't have an answer. Like I don't have some satisfactory, like amazing story of, you know, we were again on the front cover of the times. We did this, we did that. We got on this, the biggest podcast in the world, none of that. But I'm super proud of the fact that we created a community of people who are inspired to take action. Right. And then because this was so approachable and life changing, right? That, that's a pretty darn good combination, approachable and life-changing. They felt comfortable bringing it to their friends and family, right? And it just kept growing and kept growing. And that has been our, our path here. And, you know, it's, it truly is, it's that 1% better, right? Like that's one of the themes over whatever it is, 500 roughly episodes of Choose I is like that 1% better aggregation of marginal gains. Right. And I think this really appeals to people who listen to the show that you don't have to hit a home run. You don't have to catch lightning in a bottle. You just have to take action. You need to just try to look for ways to make your life better. And Jonathan, similar to you, when you had whatever it was, $184,000 left and you sent that, that next $500, like, did it seem all that great? No, I mean, I'm sure it was nice seeing 183.5, but it didn't feel like you were getting there. But you know what? You kept sending that over and over and over again. And then some months it would be, hey, I'm going to send $2,000 this month. And all of a sudden the balance goes down a little bit more. And then the interest on the payment that the, the next payment you sent is going to go down. And did you really feel that? You know, like, oh, I made a couple dollars more in principle this month on my payment. Like, but it adds up. It compounds, right? Like, it's those 1% things. And that's what I've seen in my own personal life is like, you know, I've gotten healthier and fitter 1% by 1%. I can't point to any moment. I didn't train for a marathon and all of a sudden I was fit or I didn't go on, you know, whole 30 or whatever it is. And, and that's not denigrating any of those things. There, many of those things are wonderful, but like, it wasn't like that for me. It was just, it was 1% after 1%. And I, I would argue I'm probably the healthiest I've ever been in my entire life. And, you know, it's interesting, right, to see that cross the chasm of both business and personal. And I think I think you can see it everywhere. When you were mentioning, you know, just the, the value of taking action um, on these life changing ideas, there's some comparisons here in the in the business world in that with every one of the businesses they they looked at, there was a competitor that had access to the exact same information that that they did. Right. Like it wasn't that this company uncovered the secret that the other company didn't have. It was rather they both had access to the same data about where market trends were going. But for some, they just felt the cost of change was too big and they just they 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 didn't move. They didn't disrupt. They weren't willing to, They you know, they just, eh, you know, it's good. It's OK. <clears throat> it's the same thing for us, like the information that Brad and I have on the show, while life changing is not. It shouldn't be a secret. It shouldn't be like, it, it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't be that mind blowing. It should be like universal truths and life concepts. All of us should have access to this type of information. And since this podcast is free, clearly like the barrier to entry is, is one just, you know, listening and ingesting it, but really it's, are you willing to actually take action on these ideas? And when you look at like how we kind of identify with this idea of being a value, so not being a spender or not being cheap or frugal, whatever term, but this idea of being a value, there's really a, a, a principle here 
that comes through and not just uh, this book, but, uh, you know, most business books. And it's this idea of addition through subtraction. In a world where everything is like, well, well, what if you just do this one more thing? Just do this one more thing. One of the, the the truths that came through is, you know, these these great leaders in many cases made it their priority to strip away the noise and the clutter and focus on just a few things. And so while many of us have a to-do list, probably in parallel to that, it'd be worth considering, do we have a stop-do list, right? Is there, you can't always be adding, what are what are you cutting? If you buy everything, you value nothing, right? And it is it is relatively simple in this world through easy credit, easy to access credit to be able to afford the payments on everything. You value nothing. You value nothing. How how do you know if it's a great purchase? It's one of many. It's one of, you know, it's it's embedded in there. It is so easy to finance our life up to our eyeballs. And it makes it very, very hard for us to actually appreciate what we have. And I think that's what we figured out in the financial independence community. A lot of what we do is addition through subtraction. It's not that we we live in a state of deprivation, but we're not afraid of the concept of deprivation as a tool to find out what is it that we value. When you value something, you think it's great. When you surround yourselves with great things, great purchases, great exchanges, of your life energy, it's going to lead to a, to a great life, you know? And, 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 and that I think is what we, we really should focus on in terms of why are we on this path and how do we start making this transition from good to great? It's looking at the reduction, the reduction of clutter in our life. Yeah. As you're going through this, I'm thinking about there, there's, there's that little bit of, of tension between the simplicity that I crave and doing something new that might lead to greatness. Like that was my original thought as you were, as you were talking about this, I I jotted this down 20 minutes ago, but I think what you just said is, is actually the answer to my question, which is what we're really doing is we're creating a framework of a life that works where there isn't extraneous garbage. There's not, you're not checking things off a list just to feel proud of yourself. Yeah. You're arguing to ruthlessly cut those things out of your life if you possibly can to make room for the great, whatever Mm. you define that is, right? Like great can, this doesn't have to be something grandiose that's life-changing. Like, like for me, I've talked about, I'm learning or trying to relearn to speak Japanese. Okay. And this is extremely difficult for me. Like, and I have been plugging away with, at it for, it's probably almost, a, I don't know, at least six to nine months, might be a year. What are you using as a tool for that? I'm using a, an app called, uh, and a language learning system called Pimsler. Hmm. Actually, Ed, Ed on our team told me about it. And, uh, it's like the gold standard for, for learning languages to at least a conversational, uh, I guess standpoint, let's say. And, I mean, I'm going really slow, like painfully slow, but I'm sticking, I'm sticking to it. And, you know, that time it's like 30 minutes a day that comes from somewhere else, right? Like I've had to cut out something else. And for me, I'm trying to cut out a lot of other content consumption. Okay. So, you know, I'm, as you know, I'm somewhat uh, famous for listening to a lot of podcasts and this is uh, something that I'm trying to to cut out because there is that tension, right? And I know that, sure, I'm learning stuff listening to a lot of podcasts. It's, you know, I feel good about my, I'm checking the off the list, you know, all this stupid stuff. But a lot of times it stops me from having that 30 minutes a day to learn Japanese. So I think that's something that I've decided, like, I feel like I've had a fresh start now since uh, the kids went back to school and like the end end of summer, I've been to CrossFit now five times in the last 11 days, which feels great. I I think I've probably gone five times in the prior nine months. You know, I've been exercising, but I haven't done, I haven't gone to CrossFit and it feels great. I am trying to cut back on some of my other nonsense consumption and I'm really sticking to doing my 30 minutes of Japanese. So, you know, again, that that's my life. I'm not arguing that anybody should try to, to copy what I'm doing here, but like, when you do cut out the other nonsense and you've created 
a framework of a life that's simple, then you can go after these things that you might feel really proud of yourself. Like if I can go to Japan in two or three years with my family and actually converse in Japanese, like that will be something that I'm genuinely proud of because I work my tail off for something that like it is not easy. And it especially is not easy for me. I don't, I don't seemingly have an aptitude for, for languages. But, you know, whereas most people probably go through one lesson a day, like I've had to go back and do them two or three times each. And that's fine. Like I'm just plugging, like I don't have a, I need to do this in six months goal or I need to prove to anybody. I'm just trying to learn. And I find that really, I find that really exciting, not demotivating. Hmm. Yeah. It's uh, I'd, I'd be curious for our audience just to kind of extend that challenge out to you. So if you have a to-do list, what's on your stop-do list, right? What's on your stop-do? What are you cutting? What, what, what are you cutting that's going to really allow you to lean in to all these things that you want to tackle this year? Um, it's equally important. And let me give you permission to say no to those things, to unwind yourself. So if that's the case, if you have something you want to share, Brad, they can uh, tweet at you or uh, reply to your weekly email. Yeah. Yeah, those are the uh, two easiest ways to get in touch with me. Yeah, uh, choosevi.com slash subscribe. I send out a weekly email every Tuesday and you just hit reply and I read every single email and I'm trying desperately to catch up and reply to <laughs> all of them if I possibly can. And like you said, uh, Twitter is my new thing. So uh, at Brad Choosevi. We don't buy things with money. We buy them with hours from our life. Vicki Robin talks about your life energy or, you know, this is an old concept. Henry David Thoreau says the price of anything is the amount of life you exchange for it. But the irony of age, uh, and this is how most people live their lives, is that when you're young, you have time, you have no money, and you have lots of energy. When you're at an adult, you know, Brad, I would put you now firmly into the adulting category. You have, <laughs> I have no a safe time. Deposit box. Most, I'm in. <laughs> you have no time. <laughs> but you have money and you have energy. And then, you know, as you move on up and now you identify as, well, I'm old. Okay. You have time and you have money, but you have no energy. And, you know, is there a sweet spot where we could get all three? You know, is there a paradigm that we could build where we could have time, money, and energy, and then we actually take action on things um, that, you know, light us up, that light us up. Those who don't have to trade time for money are filthy rich. What's your plan and how are you going to transition from good to great? All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.